the Retire Sooner podcast mm-hmm. is all about trying to help people figure out their their best path through best path financially to be independent as soon as they possibly can. Yeah. Right. So in the world we live in, you've heard the a million scary statistics where, you know, 85% of 66 year olds have less than 10 grand saved for their life. So it's kind of like, well, if we can help anybody get to retirement, that's a miracle to begin with. If we can help people get a year sooner or three years sooner, or five years sooner, that's like a huge miracle. Yeah. And, and so much of it though, in real life is being in the investment industry for 20 plus years, it's usually pretty, it's, it's usually a very unique path for somebody, anybody that comes to me and is like, Hey, I'm ready to retire. I'm 59. It's like, wow, what'd you do? Like, it's usually, <laughs> it's, there's, it's a very unconventional every time. It's like this unique fingerprint. And I think that's what we can learn too from you is that your path was just really unconventional. You went to business school before you even graduated from college. But so you've kind of made your own rules, which is kind of the way to financial independence. But I wanted to start with where did all of that leadership and uh, the, the ability to be able to continue to press on regardless come from? And I, so I wanted to hear about as a kid, like, tell me the, tell me the, the tough times of being a kid and what you learned early on. Yeah. The, I mean, part of it was in before up until I was nine, you know, I grew up, I had both parents around, but both sides of my family were incredibly poor uh, and except, except us, except my dad. And Mm -hmm. so I grew up seeing uh, people who lived at the, you know, sort of bottom of the economic spectrum, um, trailer parks, good, honest, blue collar workers, but also on drugs, in jail, you know, no job, what others might look at and say, hey, you got a lot of deadbeats in your Mm -hmm. family. Um, And I never looked at it that way, but that is how some might describe what it, you know, what it looked like. And so I didn't, other than my immediate home life, I didn't have an example around me of middle class or lower middle class, you know, this, so I grew up in a very gritty, you know, Mm -hmm. we were chasing chickens around the chicken coop and in the trailer. (laughs) And that's where we'd go to watch the TV with the um, aluminum foil ears and, you know, eating very simple food. And so it was a, a, a simple upbringing, but my dad was an alcoholic. And so even though we were the um, better off ones financially, mm-hmm. it, in my mind, it came at the cost of safety and, mm-hmm. and comfort and watched my mom have such a difficult time. So very early on, even as a child, I disassociated money with happiness which is very unusual. You know, many people connect money to happiness. It becomes an aspiration. I wanted nothing to do with it because I was very aware that it was in part enabling my father's alcoholism. And why did he have some, did he just have a functional job? And he he had, he had a, he was an executive at an auto company. So he had a white collar job and he was out golfing and at the pool halls and, out late. And, um, you know, it was just this interesting, I didn't grow up. The one example I had of someone with a fancy job was not someone I respected mm. even as a child. And and that, so, so that was your day. So you saw your dad, he was making enough money. Oh yeah. He, he was making but, a ton of money. Um, and so, so that, that is an important data point mm-hmm. to set aside specifically given the audience and the listeners here, uh, because it does tap into sort of psychology and its connection to money. And so, so then set that aside, we leave my dad when I'm nine years old, I have two younger Mm -hmm. sisters, they were three and six at the time, my mom was what was called a secretary. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and so we were poor, like all of a sudden, even though we were the only ones that had the nice house, and we had presents every holiday season, and we had a car and we had a playhouse. Now, all of a sudden, we're just like everybody else in the family. And, and I remember when my mom came to me and said, that's it, I'm done, we're leaving mm. with no money, um, no support. Again, the re- all of the family was very poor. There was no one who could really help us. Mm. Um, even then, and, and I know she was so scared. She was scared mainly because of the financial 
circumstance that would put us in. Yeah. Um, when she told me we were leaving, I did not cry. I did not get upset. I looked at her and said, what took you so long? Mm. At nine. At nine years old, you knew that she needed to get, to get out. And the, the lesson in that is that the people who are closest to the action, which in this case is me, the little girl who had been in the car when my dad was in a car accident and got pulled over for drunk driving and, mm. and saw the fights. And the lesson in that is the people who are closest to the action know what the right thing to do is long before the leader ever does it. And this is true in business and it's true in our personal lives because we're human and it takes a lot of stuff to force us to make difficult and uncomfortable compromises and uh, sacrifices and decisions. And she was so dreading telling me her oldest daughter this. And meanwhile, I'm like, great, at least maybe, maybe it'll get a little better. So we left. Uh, my mom worked three jobs to support us. She fed us on a food budget of $10 a week for three years. This wasn't in the 1930s. You know, this is mm -hmm. like in the eighties, yeah. late, late eighties. And so I grew up seeing her grit, her resilience. She never spoke ill of our father. So her grace and positivity around the situation and tying it very literally to your question, uh, I had a lot of responsibility at home because she was working all the time. So I needed to- How many siblings again are there, Kat? Two, two younger, three girls. You're, you're the oldest of three girls. Yeah. <clears throat> so as an example, I mean, yeah, again, we're not talking about you know, post, you know, World War One here, we're talking about like the modern world. We're pretty similar age. Uh, I'm a little I'm a, I'm a little older. But yeah, I remember if, you, if I think back into the in the 80s, how, how are you guys living on like the how, how literally what's an example of a food budget of 10 bucks? Yeah. For what is that? 10 bucks a day for the family or 10 bucks? What yeah. is it? How did you do it? My mom over and over. Are you sure you remember that? Right. <laughs> uh, we've, Crazy. Done, we've done several podcasts together and we're in Angela Duckworth's book grit. The, and she, the, yeah, she uh, the, 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 interviewed yeah. my mom and I, and, and so, um, you Underneath. know, she interviewed my mom and I, and so I've heard my mom tell this story over and over and over. And and it was, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you what she says and then what I remember. <laughs> you know, what I remember is a lot of beanie weenies, potted meat, uh, and and really bad bread. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what I remember. Um, and what she, how she describes it is far more um, strategic, far more systemic. So she would say, look, I'd go to the butcher at the grocery store and get these scraps. And then we would buy the cans. You know, we eat a lot of food out of cans. Um, yeah. I get the cans on sale The you know, the buy three, get two free or, or whatever it was. So it was coupons, sale products, canned product that had enough protein and decent taste for us to eat it. But I mean, potted meat, I don't know if the listeners even know what that is, but look at Well, it. I guess that would be like <laughs> spam, like spam is in the can, canned it's meat, right? Incredible. It's spreadable. Yeah. <laughs> Meat's not supposed to be spread. So, you know, all that to say she was, um, she was, she did what she had to. And yeah. I don't remember it ever being bad. You know, it was fine. We certainly weren't eating organic. I don't even remember having like berries or right. fish other than catfish that we caught in the lake, you know, until I was much, 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 much older. Where was so, so you went from like, you went from being kind of surrounded a little bit by poverty to pretty much into poverty. You guys were poor. Yeah. And what, what jobs did she do? And then at what age was, so what, what were her jobs? So she, so she was still the secretary at, mm -hmm. at a different auto imports company <clears throat> called Southeast Toyota. Um, and, and what state was this in, by the way? Jackson, this is Jacksonville, Florida. It's in Jacksonville, okay. Florida. Um, and, and what's interesting is it was with a company called JM Family Enterprises, a man named Jim Moran that is, and this will make sense for my mom's story, um, who I would later learn had his company, JM Family Enterprises, on the best companies to work for list for ever. And he was just an independent owner who owned these auto import and then related businesses. But he started a credit union for his employees. He had radical profit sharing plans. Mm -hmm. And so my, while my mom earned a entry level wage, she had fantastic benefits. 
Um, later she would have a profit sharing that would be a nice boost to the family. Not a lot, you know, as a, mm-hmm. as a secretary, but meaningful when you can, when you can make that little go that far, uh, you know, a check of, I don't even know what it was, but let's just say it's 20 or 30 or $40,000. That was just a really big deal for you guys. A, yeah. A huge deal. And that was much later. That was after we got out of this early stage. Um, but, and so this is just a note for the value of employers Mm-hmm. providing the basics, you know, the, the benefits and the care um, so that people can take care of their families. And my mom will never forget the quality of that day job. It wasn't enough, you know, salary wise to have us live the same lifestyle we were living, but it was, it was enough for the basics. And then she hosted wine parties. So she would do like wine tastings and sell these multi-level, you know, think oh, she, was, she, she did some MLM. Yep. She did some MLM. Yeah. Um, and, and then lots of other odd help and support jobs. So the, um, before the gig economy was a thing, <laughs> you know, before the sharing economy was a thing, she was, she was a part of that. And so she just pieced it all together, reduced expenses radically, kept a really good attitude and worked her rear end off to bring in revenue, you know, the, the top line. And eventually about four, three or four years into that worst of it, from when I was nine to 12, she started moving up in her company. Mm-hmm. She got a management job. She was running the plant. She ran the Lexus Remanoof program where you know used cars were coming in being um, upgraded for their remanufactured program. And then she had a better salary and better benefits. And in her own right, she started, she didn't need those extra jobs anymore. And, and, and eventually she met an amazing man who she married, but that was right before I got out of high school. So, and, and then that helped, you know, the income and the partnership helped. So a couple of lessons here. So one, this is fascinating lesson or, or thought that you as a kid knew way before she, your mom knew you kind of like, Hey, the line worker knows the problem before the CEO. Yeah. I, it's I like, it's- I, yeah, the, the person who's closest to the action knows before the leader takes action. I mean, my mom knew mm-hmm. she, she had other pressures and other concerns that were keeping her from taking action on that thing. And the issue with things like this, tough decisions, is that the people who are closest to the action lack two things that the leader has. They mm-hmm. lack, or in this case, I lacked the language to articulate the problem or the solution. And right? I couldn't have, I didn't know that we could have left. Otherwise I would have asked to leave. <laughs> you know, it, I, I didn't see that. There weren't a lot of single, I mean, people, a lot of people in my family were not happy and they were poor, but many of them were married. You know, I didn't know that you could split. That wasn't on TV at that time. It wasn't mm-hmm. a thing. Um, so people who are closest to the action lack the language to articulate the problem or the solution, and they lack the authority to do something about it. Yeah. Two things that the leader does. So, you know, the leader, whether it's the mom, the dad, the person running the business, to your point, is the trick is going really close to the people who are close to the action and having conversations often. So either you discover things you didn't know, or you get grow the courage to take action on what you know you should, because you are reminded that people who are dealing with it really do need and deserve better. The And, and then if we get into, by that time though, by 12, Kat, mm-hmm. y- you know, that's enough time in life. You know, yep. you, you met one of my kids here who's a, just turned 11 and, you know, he's like a semi grown up already, right? At 11, yeah. 12, you, you've kind of been, for, there's a lot of formation that's happened. So you got to that point and you had mentioned earlier that you didn't associate money with happiness or you had just said, look, as long as we can survive and live, then that's fine with you. And then do you still feel that today? No, I mean, I've, I've evolved. I recognize there was a point where that, that mindset became very unhealthy. Um, so, it, you know, there's, there's, extremes well, of, there's extremes of any belief system. If you, mm-hmm. if you think money's the key to happiness, then you're going to chase money and it'll never fix the problems. At the same time where I was, where I rejected money, every time I made it, I gave it away. You know, mm. I was the person who, if there was anyone in the restaurant, anyone in the bar, my friends, I would buy everything for them. Just, it, it brought me so much joy. Mm. And I cared not about keeping it. I, mm. I just, 
It didn't matter to me. And I always believed it would come. I mean, I started working when I was 15 and it was very simple. If you want to make more money, pick up more shifts. Work. If you, if you and, and as a waitress in a casual dining establishment, it's not only about how many hours you work, it's the ability to make more per hour by building bigger checks and giving better service. And, and so to me, there was always a, an, uh, an option, an opportunity to earn more. And so I never worried. I never worried about money. And, and, and I think what also was true is I lived simply. I didn't grow up with a, you know, aspiring to live a materialistic lifestyle. Uh, and I didn't want to keep it. It brought having friends um, feel happy or gifted or taken care of brought me far more joy. Than you getting like a fancy car at the, the yeah. minute you had money. Yeah. yeah. Well, so there's two things that I want to the, so you think of money, you probably still, let me ask you this question. I think I know, I, I know you how your answer, but I'll let you answer it. Is that, do you think of money as a kind of this reservoir or do you think of money as a river? I think now of money. Um, I don't know that either of those two really, it feels like, air more, right? It's just, mm -hmm. all, it's, it's around, it's there. If you, you can breathe really deeply and get all the benefits of that air, or you can sit back and not exercise and not have a lot of the air, you know, it's, mm -hmm. uh, I, as, as I evolved, as I started earning more, um, as I started having the opportunity to invest, as I, as I matured and, and now have a husband and children and a family, and with some support, my husband's got a, just a phenomenal kind of money psychology. And we even partnered with a wealth manager who also has a background in psychology of money to mm -hmm. help us explore um, how our childhood and the things we grew up with have affected the way we think about money and the way we treat it and how that affects really our ability to retire sooner, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. that, and someone like me who thinks it'll always be there. What's yeah. beautiful is I'm rarely stressed about mm -hmm. it. I, I believe I was a phenomenal waitress and bartender and I can always go back to doing that. And always I, kind of that last, if the world ended, I could still do this. If my career ended. Yeah. And so you do think of it as a flow. And I think that the analogy, the reason I use that analogy is that if you think of uh, money to some extent as this flow and it's going to continue on and there's this almost this bubbling up of a spring and it'll continue to run. That's one way to kind of think of money like, hey, it's probably not going to run out versus Hey, I've got, I've just got this finite yeah. resource and it's in a pool and I just really have to be super careful about it because that's, that's all the money I'll ever have. And that's why I kind of use that analogy. And I think that the earlier, the happy retiree has your mindset, which is, <clears throat> Hey, it's going to continue to flow in some way. And it sounds like psychologically, that's how you've got that really great psychological foundation that in the end, I always think of it this way. Like if, the finan I remember thinking this during one of many financial crises in America, right? I've been a in, in investments for 20 plus years is they thought that if, you know, the banking system totally melts down and the stock market goes to zero, you know what I can do? I can go back to landscaping. I, like, yeah. I painted houses all through college. I'm like, I can just go paint houses, right? Yeah. So let's get to, to that, that those, those jobs. Like you started out at 16, uh, I want to talk about your work early on to start climbing kind of this ladder. And then what the hell do kids do now? Because it's, it feels different for me. Like I had a, this, uh, I started like, a, I lived in rural Pennsylvania on a farm and started a camp for kids in the summer. And it was like, I could, back when I was like 14, 15, we could never do any of those things today, living in the big city, regulations, issues, you know, just the, it's so different today and it's only been 25 years since we were, you know, super young. Mm -hmm. where, where, how did you get started in work today? Or I'm sorry, when you were a teenager, how did you get started then? I, I mean, my first job when I went to a place to earn something in exchange was when I was 15 and I cleaned gym equipment because I needed a gym membership to train for, um, for school athletics. And mm -hmm. I didn't have the money to pay, we didn't have the money to pay for a gym membership. And so it was a, what was called a trade out, right? I work, you let me get the benefits of, of, of the equipment of the harder. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and, and so that was job. That was the first like job were other than the normal neighborhood stuff. Of course, from the time I was 12 or 13, I was babysitting, I was mowing lawns, I was doing all, to your point, all those things to help support the com- local community right. um, from a very young age. We lived on a cul-de-sac and I helped take care of other people's homes and children in the cul-de-sac. And that gave me a little bit of play, play money. Uh, but then when I turned 15, which was the youngest age that I could go in and do work in another place, I started cleaning gym equipment. When I turned 16 and could drive and could legally now be paid to work in the state mm-hmm. of Florida, um, I went to work in a mall to sell clothes. And there, there were many reasons why. One, it's a common job of a young person to go get a job in a, in a mall or was. Um, I needed the discount on clothes. It, it allowed me to afford nicer clothes, cool clothes, you know, for me and my family, because otherwise we were going to Kmart yeah. and Walmart. And even then we were buying things on layaway at Kmart and Walmart. Um, and so, so this was a, it was a, there was an aspirational element of getting to, to work there. I could afford bongo jean shorts, you know, as opposed to whatever Kmart had on layaway. Bongos. Yeah. Yeah. And so the listeners should Google. It's pretty funny. Uh, And and so but the other benefit was I earned a commission. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was my first sales job and I was very good at it. I set the top sales record even as a part time worker when I was 16 years old. (laughs) And um, and it, it was I can look back now and see why I was not a salesperson. I genuinely felt that I was the tour guide for people's experience to help them find what would be best for them. And, and I delighted in seeing people being delighted with their choices. And, but what that resulted in was wildly high commissions for a 16 year old who worked part-time. And what that then resulted in is, Oh, work is liberating and I can pay for my car and my insurance, um, which was a really beat up, 1989 Toyota Corolla. Um, and, and so, so that was the first job. And then I was recruited to go work at Hooters as a waitress, but I was too young to serve alcohol. So I started as a hostess. And you did, we used to be 18 to do serve alcohol. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So you did a hostess until you got to be 18. Yeah. So I was still cleaning the gym equipment. I didn't stop doing that. Um, I was working in a mall, layered that on, And I became a hostess. So at the peak, I had three jobs between 17 and like six months into being 18. Once I could become a waitress and have far greater earning potential, Mm -hmm. I dropped the other two jobs. Um, And and also it was making it difficult for me to be on time for my waitressing job that I had. By by the way, it's funny. My uh, one of my kids asked me about this today. We were talking about your story. How how much? Luke, I think asked me, how much can you make in a day? Like, is, if you're a waitress or you're your server, how much could, could you actually make in a day? A lot. <laughs> I mean, I'll say like the a couple average. hundred bucks. Oh yeah. Easily. Oh, yeah. I mean, a, a hundred, 150 a day would be the floor for a full shift. 300 would be good, really good. Um, That's real money though. But, yeah. Oh, real money. And I mean, my first corporate gig when I turned 20 to go work in the Hooters corporate office was a 50% pay cut from being a waitress. Um, I mean, I think that year I have to go back and look at the tax returns, but I I think my, my gross income was somewhere around $40,000. As As in when you became an exact, when you became a management. no, No, when I was a waitress. Okay. Okay. I a waitress because I was working close opens. I was working multiple shifts as a cook, a bartender, a waitress, um, all weekends, right? Day shift and night shift. I mean, I. It was when I started as a corporate employee that my salary was twenty one thousand dollars. That I remember. Gross. Yeah, and then there's well, there's no no <laughs> tips whatsoever, right? That's it. Twenty one no, grand. Yeah. Okay. So that was a big shift for me. Uh, and, and I learned the hard way. I didn't have financial education. I didn't grow up around money management. As we've already discussed, I didn't necessarily think, you know, money was great. Um, and I always believed it would come. So when I shifted from being an hourly employee earning tips Mm -hmm. to a salaried employee being paid only two weeks 
only every two weeks off a piece of paper and making half, I got in trouble fast. I yeah. got in hard debt fast. I, I didn't, I didn't understand. And, and so, and my living expenses were um, minimal, but now I'm in a bigger city. You know, I went from Jacksonville to Atlanta. Um, I was in a, a rundown apartment, you know, with my beat up car. So my expenses were pretty low, but all of a sudden my salary was cut in half. Now the good news was I was too busy to go hang out with friends or go, and I didn't really have friends because I just moved to a new city. Um, but very quickly, uh, I was in credit card debt and I had maxed, I think I had a $5,000 credit card. So line. easy to run that up. So and easy it, to run that up. Yeah. All of a sudden the, the, you know, they were calling you owe us money, you know, that, that experience, I was 21 because uh, I, I took the corporate gig when I was 20. So I made this radical shift from cash to biweekly salary um, when I was 20 years old. And it was overnight. You know, I didn't, there was no education mm -hmm. uh, of how to manage that and, and, and change my lifestyle and think differently. And I hadn't really pulled up a big savings at all because I always believed it would come. And so that, that was a big deal. And I, I, luckily I was open enough and vulnerable enough to tell one of my coworkers, I'm like, I'm getting these calls from the credit card companies and it's giving, it's like scaring me. It's scary. Yeah, anxiety. Uh, and it's intimidating and not a lot of things intimidate me. And that made me very scared. Mm -hmm. um, and that was before there were laws around some of these tactics. Oh, and they can be, they can be brutal. Yeah. Yeah. And she said, you know what? The same thing happened to me call this number, this credit counseling number, they will help you negotiate your debt down and help give you some training. And, and I, I got out of it, right? We settled the balances. I paid it off. Literally since then, I have never, ever owed anyone money. Mm. Never. Um, and because I didn't like that feeling at all. It's a terrible feeling. Yeah. yeah. And, and so you then went from, so how many years, so you had a, f a fair amount of years for kind of working your way up on the corporate side at Hooters. Yeah. yeah. And that went, I know you opened up franchises years. all over the world, right? Australia and, and, and uh, Latin America. And then how did- 19, 19. And then when did you make the, so at what point were you then in this executive conversation to like go run one of the, I guess, well, Cinnabon was part of Focus Brands, yeah. correct? So, so for our audience- just a, a quick rundown of all the different brands in uh, at, at Focus or, or several of them, because most of them are, are people will know. Oh, yeah. Um, so um, so the brands today yeah. uh, is fewer when I started and then we bought, you know, acquired more brands. But the brands today uh, are Cinnabon, which is what I joined to be the president of Auntie Anne's Pretzels. Jamba Juice, Carvel Ice Cream, Moe's Southwest Grill, McAllister's Deli, uh, and Schlotzky's. Schlotzky's, yeah. Every, you know, literally like American favorites. Everybody yeah. loves those things. The only reason I don't eat them every day is that I feel like it's like a, a giant thing of carbohydrates. And I'm yeah. like, I want it so, it's with butter. It's better than any, Annie's pretzels are the best thing on the planet. Like yeah. I would just, I, that and Cinnabon together. But what, how old were you when you did that? And, and you weren't like an executive before you got the president job. Right? Oh yeah, I was I was vice president at Hooters when I was 26. I was promoted yeah. to vice president at Hooters when I was 26, and the company was doing somewhere between seven and eight hundred million in revenue at that point. And and so I was then an executive for five years in at right. Hooters while we grew. So I'm a part of the executive team, um, learning and growing. That company was fully vertically integrated. So I got to help. You know, I was exposed to the responsibility for supply chain and marketing and all the C level and, group. And, yeah. yeah. Um, and so I just learned so much in that company that ended up making me ready, maybe not on paper, mm -hmm. but in, in actuality, made me ready to go run a business. And I was recruited by private equity firms to go work in their private equity firm. Uh, as these PE firms were really leaning into franchising um, and, and eventually was asked to interview for the job to be president of Cinnabon. And I- In your 20s, in your 20s. No, oh no, at 31. 31, okay, still uh, super young. I was executive at Hooters from 26 to 31 uh, and then interviewed and got the job. And so I became president of Cinnabon when I was 31 
and helped turn the company around out of the recession. And then as Focus Brands grew, I grew. I became group president of the company, launching this big multi-channel like e-com licensing CPG division, uh, and then became president and COO of that. So running the whole thing um, in 2016. You, the one thing that I've read that is, I'd love for you to share with our audience, because I think it applies to pretty much anyone's job, everyone's job, and kind of just life in general. And that's this, this three questions that you ask. And it's kind of how you learned the like it, the grassroots. You went in and you made, you actually took out the trash and made Cinnabons and worked in the company for a little while to really understand it. And you were kind of going through these three things. Can you kind of go through those for our audience, which I love? Yeah. Anytime I take over a team or a business, uh, or I'm just going through an annual reflection process to reset priorities. I ask some version of these three questions. Um, the first question is, is you know, what can we stop doing? Uh, and the way that's worded in a product business, like when I went to work at, in the Cinnabon stores, is what are we throwing away? Like, what is it we're spending money on that we're not using? That we don't what really we need to. Okay. That, that if it went away, it's not going to hurt the business because we're not using it. We're spending money on it. It probably made sense at some point. Um, but it doesn't anymore. And no one's taken the time to say, you know, that's not serving us anymore. We don't need that. It's, it's the equivalent of today um, signing up for a subscription for something, forgetting and about it and never it's using charging it your bank account. You know, that, that is the, there is a business equivalent to that. And so, and, and the reason I asked that first is in, in the case of Cinnabon, there was no money tree. I mean, we were in the recession, the business was performing poorly. There was no, like banks were not loaning mall-based sweet treat franchisees money. And the private sweet equity treat. firm wasn't, you know, wasn't really excited about plowing more money into an uncertain, you know, business model. And so- So you I, had to find the money. I find it. I had to find it. So if so, I wanted- So Kat, what, well, give me one example. What did you get to kind of cut out? Like, what's an example? Like people were not buying what, but you're spending money on it. Well, it's, it's not just what people buy. It's what we were spending money on even for the employees. Mm -hmm. And so things like printed training manuals, when the world has gone digital, even then, that caught, that's real money. Like that's, those are dollars. They take up space on the shelf. It's cash being used for something that employees aren't using, yet the corporate office required it. <laughs> so you just, you had to keep doing it and you had to keep buying it, but nobody was using it. But if you didn't, you would get, you know, dinged or sure. audit, you wouldn't get your points and you'd be fined or whatever. So, so there were internal things that we were spending money on that we could stop. Uh, and then there were customer facing things um, such as extra utensils or, um, even the portion sizes, you know, one of the answers was we're watching people throw away a part of the cinnamon roll. Mm -hmm. And, and the answer wasn't shrink the cinnamon roll. The answer was provide a smaller one because the world has changed. And there are people who just want something cheaper and smaller, but they still want a treat. Yes. And so this, um, this realization that there are many things that people throw away and throw away is a metaphor for don't value, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's not always what literally ends up in the garbage. That doesn't make sense in some businesses, but it's what are we producing or spending our time on that no one is using relative to the cost of providing it. Okay. And so said another way, what can we stop doing? And then once I have that and I find patterns, then that allows me to save some money, right? Or save some hours in labor. I'm saving because that's going to fuel the answer to the second question, which is when do we say no? When do we say no to employees? When do we say no to customers? Because that is the market giving us a signal of things they would probably pay us for if we had them. For some oh, reason. hey, hey, what are we not providing? Right. Yeah, like smaller portions, like coffee, like you know, certain benefits for the employees. So there, and if someone's asking us for things consistently, I'm not talking about one-off random things, patterns. Um, if someone's asking us for things consistently, then there's a reason they think we should be doing it. The competition is providing it. They have alternatives. And like, there is a reason if it is a consistent ask. And then if our answer is consistently no, we will likely lose them 
over time. If we don't provide something, the competition will. So that is about what can we start doing that would add value. And then the third question is really supporting the thesis or validating what comes out of the answers for the first two. And that third question is simply, if you were me, what is one thing you would do differently to improve the business? And then similarly, I find patterns in those answers. And you put all that together. What can we stop doing that won't hurt the business if we stop, but will save us time, money, and energy? What can we start doing that is rooted in some rationale to believe it will be good for the business? And then what are the themes of feedback that people give that will make their job easier, that will make them happier, that will please customers? And you put all that together and it's pretty easy to come up with a relatively clear, almost perfect prioritization of key initiatives. And you're able to take that and then pretty quickly have a roadmap to then implement at Cinnabon for, for really a lot of years. I mean, you were, you, you ran that business for a long time, right? I ran it for four years. Um, but I had to ask those questions every six months because the good news was we were making an impact on the answers we received to the question six months prior. And so now there's a different answer, right? People, customers said they wanted smaller portions. We put smaller portions in. So that's not an opportunity yeah. anymore. Now there's something else and something else and something else. And so it's just constantly, mo- you know, you're just getting a little better, but a little better in the things that matter most on a regular basis. So then, I, so then if I'm focused brands, which has all these different uh, franchises, I'm looking at you and say, okay, Kat, can you kind of, run the whole thing. And then you, you, you became COO to then help the entire suite of businesses now, right? That was your next leap up. Yeah. I was but, group president running the licensing, building the licensing division and then president and COO. So all the presidents of the brands reporting to me, nine presidents. So how brutal though was, I mean, this pandemic has just upended this economy in ways where that are, that are just, permanent. They mm-hmm. are permanent that I never, even three months in thought, oh, well, the economy will go back to a, just permanent changes in so many areas, which is so fascinating to me. What did you, I mean, some of these, and you're in tough locations, airports, malls, yeah. how did you guys get through this and how did you make it work for God's sakes? You know, the, the good news for the, the total company is that you know, less than 20% of the business was in malls and airports. Now, in a few of the brands, there's a larger exposure. But the beauty of having a diversified portfolio is that actually some of the businesses like Schlotsky's with drive throughs like McAllister's with pickup windows, um, like Jamba with phenomenal apps and delivery performed better. <laughs> as soon as the world opened up, they were doing you know, at pre-COVID volume levels or higher. Or higher. But you had detected, but how much were you prepping for that? Like that you guys were, we were living in a world that that wasn't really a necessity. I don't, I disagree. I I mean, from, from my perspective, it was obvious those things were a necessity long before the rest of the United States figured out it was a necessity. Like if you were paying attention in mm. the industry, yeah. you could see the, the trend. You could see the adoption of digital ordering. You could see the preference of delivery going from coastal cities and urban elites to literally elderly communities. It was already happening in mm. 2018 and 2019. And that that is what- the coastal elites, I like that. It wasn't just San Francisco doing right. Uber Eats. It was like- Four. They would I everywhere would say who's going to I remember we were one of the first national chains to sign an agreement with Postmates before Uber Eats and DoorDash even existed. Oh, and wow. I remember talking to some franchisees in tier three, tier four cities, um, you know, smaller cities, center of the country. Like, why would I pay someone what then was 30 cents off the top of the dollar for oh. for something that I, I don't even understand? And I don't think you know, people want delivery badly enough to pay, you know, for this and they didn't appreciate it and get it. And it, it started growing quickly prior to COVID. COVID was just this great accelerating event. And, um, and so that those investments that we made by paying attention to the early stages of consumer shifts, behavioral changes, um, paid dividends when COVID hit. 
um, because we had the technology in place, because we had started opening more drive throughs you know, all of these things. Now, so that, that's good for the focus portfolio and for those brands, but certainly the locations that are in malls and airports, which is a large percentage of Auntie Anne's, um, were greatly impacted because the closures lasted longer. Right. Um, however, because of similar investments, as soon as people could come back in, even though the foot traffic was 50% or 60% of what it was prior, a lot of the food tenants didn't reopen. So we were getting a disproportionate percentage of a lower number. The businesses were being run on one shift, not two. So actually the franchisees found a way, even though the revenue was, let's just say, 70, 80% of what it was pre-COVID, the expenses were also materially lower. And so they, we, as as long as the malls were open, um, many of the franchisees were finding their way to improved profitability sooner. That doesn't mean it's not still very scary to be operating in that environment because you just don't know when the next closure is going to happen and what is the long-term future of some of these malls. But some of them came back in an incredibly strong way. Again, the, the lesson is we were able to do that with more power and strength and grace because of the investments we made in talent and technology and in the brand um, long prior. And even still, it took um, radical focus to navigate 2020 as well as we did, which is far better than many. So that true. Radical, that radical focus was on two things, protect people, right? The safety of the people, cleanliness, you know, all all the physical safety things that we could do, um, including protecting jobs as much and as often as we could, giving franchisees the ability to pay their people as long as they could, even if they were completely shut down and protect cash. And those two things, that was it. Our mantra was don't talk to us if it is not about one of those two things. And really, we need to be talking about things that, that do both. And Last so, question. Yeah. The we, we've talked all about work, right? So the you know the happy retiree, the early retiree. One of the biggest lessons I've learned over many many years is the psychology of what are you going to do next, right? And and I've and I learned this from folks that retired with all the money in the world and nothing to do, versus the people that had all the things to do and just enough money to do it. They turned out to be the super happy retirees. Like they're sending me emails about Wes. Here we are, and this is what we're doing. It's like oh, this is awesome. <laughs> What so you're you've worked so hard for so many years? What is what I call these core pursuits or hobbies on steroids? What's your what's the one core pursuit that you could not get, live without, or if you had to give everything else up and you keep your one core pursuit, what would it what would it be? Yeah, I mean, outside of those those things, right? Family and um, basic health and outside of your kids, health, yeah. Um, for you, it is it is speaking and mentoring people. It is getting my lessons and experiences out into the world. I would, I would atrophy as a human if I could not do that on a regular basis. And um, it is truly my joy. I think I'm busier now <laughs> than I was when I was running Focus. Um, but I am also even more energized because I can spend a large majority of my time mentoring and sharing perspectives and and joining and holding spaces where I can share this, you know, my mistakes and my expertise and working on the book and the blog and the newsletters and just getting it all out there. I mean, that is my joy. Just Uh, totally drives you. I love that you you would atrophy as a human if you couldn't do it. I'm going to start using that. Well, I'm excited when the book comes out. I know it's, I I just finished the first draft of a book and I still teetering on what the title is going to be. It's changed like eight times. So I know that, I know that title (laughs) circus of like, oh, um, so when the book comes out, which would probably be this fall or or Uh, early 22. So early 2022, I'm excited for that book to come out and we'd we'd love, I can't wait to read it and uh, help people learn about the book. So um, yeah, I, so thank you so much. I mean, there's so many things that we've learned here from a life perspective and a business perspective. And the, I love the thought of the, you know, there are these things that you love so much and you're probably, you, you will be busier, right? Wait, when can we, when will we be, I'm so fascinated by this thought of slice where you're going to help 
all of the local joints have just as, you know, the Domino's like, which Domino's is a company because of their tech has yeah. been, you know, just a monster company. Yeah. But are you, is that, that's coming to all the local guys? Yeah. So Slice, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, is, is a technology platform for independent pizzerias and it helps them um, have websites and apps and get delivery at a much lower cost than all of these other kind of big platforms. And so you download Slice, it's an app and you use it to order from all the local pizzerias that get on the platform. And it provides them, you know, marketing and insights and most importantly to them, more sales and profitability. And it's already in 16,000 pizzerias in the country. Is it in Atlanta already yeah. or no? Yeah, oh, it it's, is. Atlanta. it's 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 started in New York. And so it's really grown in the mid Atlantic, but it's nationwide. There are pizzerias on it in all 50 states, but it's early days in some markets. So depending on where you are in Atlanta, you might have access to three pizzerias or four. But this is one of those things where the more customers download it, the more the pizzerias are excited about being on it and the more they'll learn it's more profitable for them. Slice. I'm literally going to the app store right now. And I'm going, I'm going to depth slice pizza, deliver pizza delivery. Yeah. So for our audience, this is it right here. Slice, slice. download That's... slice, order from slice. And if you have friends who own pizzerias, tell them to get on slice. So there's a huge amount of reviews there are already 196,000 reviews on, for the app. That's a lot. I mean, it's, you know, pizza is so frequent. So if you think about it, it's in 16,000 pizza, 16,000 pizzerias use slice. And so I'm think working... about the frequency of customers. Cal, we're getting sliced for lunch today here in our office. Hey, I hope you have a great pizzeria on it. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, um, well, listen, it's a, such a blessing to have you. Thank you so much for your time today. It's a, it's a somewhat early morning. I think I maybe heard some kids in the background somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> <Probably>. <laughs> uh, I, I know how that is. I've got two dogs and four kids. So working from home is kind of like a circus, but fun. And, um, but it's, it is wonderful to be able to talk with you. And I think we learned a lot. The happy retiree learned a lot. Retire sooner. You, you don't consider yourself re retired though, right? No, a lot of people think I am. I'm only 42. I'm just in this season where I'm not running a, someone else's company, but I am all in on all of these endeavors. So I'm barely at the middle of the journey. That's so great.